Purple martins are so fast and erratic that watching them feels like trying to track balloons with the air whooshing out of them. If we slow the action down to a pace that our brains can handle, we see what effort goes into a purple martin's effortless flight. The super slow-mo shows us how much work it takes to control that wingspan. Swallows need outsized shoulders for the job, and the tops of their wings, big enough to look like epaulets, provide the muscle for powering wings that extend till you're out of breath, that reach clear to the tips of their long tails. In action, those tails are ultra-fine-tuned rudders that they squeeze, spread, tilt, and practically twirl. When you see the wings at work in super slow-mo, the bird looks like he's rowing. The motion may remind us of rowing, but oars and paddles are not really an apt metaphor because rowboats and canoes are clunky, galumphing things. Now, if a water analogy is wanted, a sea otter's silken turns had come closer to resembling purple martin movement. The birds swivel and coil, reversing themselves like a change of mind, twining and braiding through the air without even water to support themselves or to slow them down. Purple martins are the largest of the swallows in North America, with notched tails and sloping foreheads that sometimes bristle into a crest. The males are iridescent dark blue-purple all over. This one is panting to help cool himself off on the sweltering day. Sometimes, when the males preen, they expose the white, fluffy plumage underneath their dark iridescence. But he doesn't mind that his jockey shorts are showing. Females and immatures have softer blue on the back, with, from one individual to another, variable amounts of gray on the head and chest, and a light gray collar on the nape. Purple martins live solely on flying insects, so they don't venture far north in any numbers during breeding season because cold spells in Alaska and Canada would deprive them of food. And that food, by the way, is not mosquitoes. There's a myth going around that they eat 2,000 mosquitoes a day, but it's more like two. The only truth in that myth is that if they subsisted on mosquitoes, they'd need a couple thousand of them a day. But that's not what they eat because their foraging starts at 15 feet above ground and then goes practically Himalayan, up to 5,000 feet high. Apparently there are bugs at that height, but that's not where the mosquitoes are. You know from experience, right, that they hang out at human height. And they're mainly woodland bugs that hate sunlight. The martins are all about light and open spaces. If the birds nest near water, they'll dip low enough to grab the occasional dragonfly. No self-respecting songbird parent is going to pass up a dragonfly meal for its nestlings. And if a mosquito happens to fly into that dragonfly hunting maw, the bird will eat it, of course. Watching the martins hunt is like following the ricochet of a pinball machine. They want to swerve and zigzag without obstruction and won't occupy a house that's close to a tall tree. Which brings us to their habit of dwelling in man-made houses. In the eastern United States, you won't find them nesting anywhere else. You'd almost think the species sprang into being with the arrival of Europeans in the New World. John James Audubon said that he always chose inns with good purple martin houses because those usually had the best accommodations. Before Europeans arrived, the Martins often lived in gourds that Native Americans put up for them. In the West, where the species is less common, they nest in cavities. So those of us in the East who've watched them in the houses people put up may think of them as colonial birds, but really they just tolerate crowds for the sake of convenient lodgings. Some swallows are colonial. Cliff swallows voluntarily build communities of a dozen to as many as 3,500 nests. 
But the Martins are more like city dwellers who tolerate the crowds because that's where the jobs are. Lord knows they chitter and chatter enough to remind us of cities full of noise. Another misconception about Purple Martins is that the first to arrive each spring from the neotropical regions where they've wintered are scouts for those who'll come later. The truth is that the older Purple Martins arrive before the rest, hoping to reclaim last year's house. The younger birds arrive a few weeks later and go looking for different digs than the ones they grew up in. Unlike most songbirds, purple martins raise only one brood, so they leave early, often at the beginning of July here in Missouri. Once those nestlings fledge, they only stick around the nest box for two to seven days, and after that, the group will head south through Central America to Brazil for the winter. <laughs>